famous passage of scripture from the Old Testament that just speaks uh, loads about the resurrection of Jesus. Isaiah chapter 53, verses 1 through 12. Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a tender shoot, like a root out of the dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised, rejected by men, a man of sorrows, familiar with suffering. Like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Sure, he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. Yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds, the King James says, by his stripes, we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. And the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. As a sheep before his shearers is silent, he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And who can speak of his descendants? For he was cut off from the land of the living. The transgressions of my people, for them he was stricken. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth, yet it was the Lord's will to crush him, to cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life a guilt offering, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life and be satisfied by his knowledge. My righteous servant will justify many. He will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great. He will divide the spoils with the strong because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sins of many and made intercession for the transgressors. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. What did you see in that passage? Anybody see Benjamin Franklin? Anybody see Harold Sloan in that? Anybody see anybody in particular in that passage of Scripture written 700 plus years before Jesus, hint, 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 was born 700 years before, Jesus' grand, great, 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 great grandfather hadn't been born yet when this scripture was prophesied in Isaiah. 700 plus years before Christ. Do you see him in this passage? I have spent, <clears throat> I left here on October the 8th and I drove back on the 18th. That's one day to get up and one day to get back. And I thought that means you take eight from 18 and I've got 10 days in New York. But actually I had nine days in New York and I'm not smart enough to know how I lost that day. But I was up there for nine days. So I, I was up worshiping in New York with family, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with Vivian's family and <clears throat> in her church. And she lives close to Suffern, New York. And in Suffern, New York, Suffern, New York has been inundated with Hasidic Jews that came originally from Brooklyn. So everywhere you go, you see something very odd to our way of living. Well, there are a lot of things kind of odd to our way of living in New York. You see all kinds of people and you hear all kinds of languages and you see black people married to brown and brown married to red and you hear, you hear Spanish. And if I knew more about it, I would know that there's five or six different kinds of Spanish being spoken in the Costco. Costco is the rich man's Sam, all right? <laughs> I had a card to Sam once. I've never had a card to Costco, but boy, you can sure buy a lot of underwear in a Costco. If you need one pair, you gotta buy four dozen. 
And if you need toilet paper, well, you just better take a big car because you go to Costco, you're going to get 100 rolls of toilet paper, three cents a piece, you know? You go into Costco and you, and you find these people with the strangest cowboy hats. They're all black, but they don't turn up. They're kind of like Clint Eastwood. They go straight out all the way around, but they have the strangest sideburns because the men, not the women, the, women, the men have these strange sideburns because they've got these pigtails going down the side and, and black uh, cords hanging and, and tassels on, on, and you think, well, that's just somebody's kind of dress until you realize all the men have these tassels going down either side of their belts going down to the side. And, and at the end of these black leather cords, there are these leather square boxes. And you have to ask somebody what that means. There are little pieces of scripture in that. That is a Hasidic Jew that patterns his life after life in Europe and the Hasidic community, the Jewish community in, in the early 1800s, something like that. Um, I spent 10 days in New York living surrounded by people that are pious in their Hasidic lifestyle. And one of those people that I have learned more about in my time away is Rabbi, help me out here, Lord, Rabbi Yitzhak Bretowitz, who says that everyone knows in his faith background, all Jewish scholars believe that Isaiah 53 refers to all the people of Israel. Because bad things have happened to them, and I don't, I don't disagree at all. The Holocaust and pogroms and various things that have happened through life. So when, when Rabbi Yitzhak reads Isaiah 53, you, don't forget, it's in his Bible too. He doesn't have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in his, but he's got Isaiah in his. When he reads Isaiah 53, he sees how hard life is for him and his folks. He says, being born in Bethlehem is no big deal. So Jesus being born in Bethlehem doesn't mean anything because a lot of people are born in Bethlehem. Well, he's kind of got a point, kind of. And he says, being raised in Nazareth means absolutely nothing. Well, that's an overstatement. But he goes on to say, a lot of boys are raised in Nazareth. So the fact that this Yeshua, Jesus, was born in one city that happened to be prophesied and raised in another that happened to be prophesied does not prove that this man is the Messiah of the Jews. Because many were born in Bethlehem. Many boys were raised in Nazareth. He goes the extra step and says, that all means nothing. He sees in Isaiah 53 his, old, his own difficult life. Rabbi Gutman Locks. I got, there he is. Rabbi Gutman Locks says Jewish scholars believe. Now you notice the other fellow said Jewish scholars all believe one thing. This Rabbi uh, uh, Gutman Locks says all Jewish scholars agree that Isaiah 53 refers to Jacob, the father of the Jewish people. And he says in a video that this was taken from that seven or eight times in Isaiah, and I'm thinking you're a rabbi, you would know the number. Why? Seven or eight. Seven or eight times Isaiah names the suffering servant of Isaiah 53 to be Jacob. And I really would like to ask the question, but it would be difficult to do without being rude. Is it eight or nine? Is it seven, eight, or nine? It's, um, you, know the, you know Isaiah better than I do. That's... You've got less Bible to memorize than I do. How many is it? He says, everybody knows. And then he gives a quote that completely conflicts with what the other rabbi says. He sees in Isaiah 53 his father, Jacob. And he goes on to say, you must have a Jewish mother to be a Jew, but your father has to come from David's lineage to be of the house and lineage of David. It's important we're both mom and dad come from. Now listen, follow this. He says, in your own Bible, talking to us Christians, it tells us that Mary is of a Jewish background. He says, I have no reason to doubt that. So Jesus is good on his mama's side. Thank you very much. But there's a problem on his father's side. And you would say, knowing, knowing those 
chronologies that are in your Bible and you say, why in the world are they there? So we can argue with Jewish rabbis in Israel about this very thing. Joseph is of the house and the lineage of David. But the rabbis say, yes, but in your Bible it says that Joseph wasn't the father. In your Bible it says that the father of Jesus was some, what, ghost? Some holy ghost? He says, there is no holy ghost in Isaiah. There is no holy ghost in the house and the lineage of David. Whoever Jesus' father was, it wasn't Joseph. So he's disqualified to be the Messiah. I bit my tongue. I just bit it, just bit it. And then went to Costco and got 12 dozen band-aids. You know, when you hear something so far removed from what you've heard all your life, from what you see with your face, since Joseph was a stepfather and Jesus' father was a Holy Ghost, Jesus not, does not qualify to be the Savior of the world. I'm, and I'm thinking to myself, how can you be so unseeing. The word I wanted to use was blind, but I'm cleaning it up because I want to be like Jesus. How can you be so unable to see? Devout Jewish eyes can read Isaiah 53 and still not see Jesus. Jesus dealt with this problem for three years. He had a lot of problems out of his own church background. Now, I understand what that's like. I was my I was the pastor of my own church for seven years a little while ago, and I understand how hard it can be to be that little boy that grows up and preach the gospel to people that told you to make Jesus important, and still it ticks them off when you say the same thing back to them. They taught it to me, I preached it back to them, and annoyed them for seven years. It's tough. Jesus dealt with being Joseph's son, being the son of a carpenter, being from around here, his whole three-year ministry. His own people had been reading about the Messiah, praying for the Messiah to come, looking for the Messiah to come, but still couldn't see the Messiah when he walked into town and fulfilled the scriptures. They read Isaiah chapter 53, and they don't see Jesus. They see their own hard life. Rabbi Gutman Locks asserts, asserts that God can't make Jesus the Messiah. That God does not have the power to make Jesus the Savior of the world because his lineage through his father, that Holy Ghost thing, is too questionable. Jesus doesn't qualify to be what you and I know him to be. You know, when you're living in Louisa and you're a Methodist and you're surrounded by a bunch of Baptists and a few Catholics, you got a few things to fuss about if you choose to. But if you go to New York City and you go to Costco and you start talking about God, when you're surrounded by people with dots on their forehead and people with, uh, with uh, uh, sideburns and the funny hat, you know, and all of that, you really got a lot you can argue about if you want to. And how to be Jesus to people who have such a different view. And of course, there are always people who don't worship anything but themselves everywhere you go. New York, I'm sure, is full of them because there's a few here in Louisa and everywhere I've ever been. The conclusion I come to is this. No matter what God does in the world, we must have eyes to see or we will miss what he is doing in our midst. Now tell me that's not true. No matter what God does, we have to have eyes to see or we'll miss it. I was at summer camp, being the dean as I did for 20 something years and one little kid got saved like just happened to you, you know, a little while ago and he got up off the altar and when it was over, he says, I need to talk to you. Aren't you a preacher? Yes, I'm a preacher. Well, you need to talk to all those preachers and tell them they need to talk more about Jesus because they're just not talking about Jesus and this salvation thing and getting saved and, and sins and forgiveness, they should have brought that up. And at first I thought, who in the world is this, man's pa this boy's pastor? What's wrong with this pastor that he doesn't? And then it dawned on me. This boy has been sitting in church his entire life over his head. And he gets to a point 
where, where it, it's time and the Holy Spirit comes in and he finally hears what I'm sure has been spoken about in Sunday school and Bible school and revivals and Sunday morning and Sunday night and Wednesday night and we are just as guilty as that little boy. No matter what God does for us, we'll miss it if we don't open our eyes and look around. Now you happen to know I like to be there when babies are born for a lot of reasons. But one of those reasons is selfish. I love to hold a newborn baby in my arms and just glory at how wonderful God's creation is. I've never held a baby in my arms whose nostrils went up instead of down. And sometimes I'll count the fingers and the toes and just laugh. You know how many there always are? Ten of each. And every toe has a toenail, but they're so teeny tiny, you wouldn't be able to put it in place if you had a magnifying glass. Perfect. And they just smell wonderful. And the mouth's always below the nose. It's like God knows what he's doing. And there's only two eyes, but they're just where they ought to be so that the child can see something. And I hold seven to nine pounds in my arms. And I'm just amazed at what God can do with a simple act of love. I held my own babies in my arms and I started crying because I knew where they came, came from. And I was amazed at how much God could do with a tender, loving act. And we weren't thinking about babies at the time. And we got this perfect thing. Beautiful little girl for our trouble. It's amazing. But you can miss what God is doing if you don't open your eyes and pay attention. So, I, got, I need to speed up here. What did God tell us in Isaiah 53? It tells us in verse 2, He grew up among us like a root of hope coming out of a dry, parched ground. If, you, if you've ever planted a garden and you've got a lot of deer around and it's a little drier than, than you thought it would be and you weren't able to water as much, you went off to New York on vacation and you're afraid your garden's not going to grow, when the first green thing kind of pops through the dirt, you just kind of celebrate. It's going to work. The garden's going to grow. For a while, I thought I was just scratching it in the dirt. But, I, okay, the corn's coming and the beans later and we're going to have squash and yada, yada. The, the, the scriptures tell us Jesus grew up among us like a root of hope out of dry ground. In Jesus' day, that dry ground was occupied Israel by the heavy hand of Rome. A painful, dry, parched time when there was no hope, when they were being oppressed, when they were being stolen from by the tax collectors and the Romans and, and the freedoms were going away in that terrible soil. Hope was born in a manger. He was not particularly handsome or charismatic. He didn't look like Joel Olstein. He didn't sing like you. I have no idea how Jesus sang, but I suspect he sang loud. But I wouldn't be too surprised if he didn't sing well, because Jesus wasn't the kind of guy who would show off. And he didn't want to make somebody else feel like they shouldn't sing because they need to listen to Jesus. So I suspect if he had a beautiful voice, he held back a little bit so that you'd join in and show him how it's done. He wasn't all that handsome. He wasn't the guy you would hope would invite you to the Jerusalem prom. He was poor, and he wasn't much to look at, the scriptures tell us in verse number two. He was despised, rejected by men in verse three. He was familiar with suffering. Are you familiar with hunger? Are you familiar with addiction? Are you familiar with pain? You know what that expression means. If you're, if you're familiar with loneliness, the suffering servant of Isaiah was familiar with our suffering. He would be despised the second part of verse 3 says, and would not be esteemed, not put on a pedestal, not honored, not treated with dignity or respect. Verse 4 tells us he would take up our infirmities and carry our shoulders on his 
uh, our sorrows on his own shoulders. Verse 5 says, he would be pierced for our, am I at the right place? He would be pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities, and our punishment was laid upon him. I'm one behind. Pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities, and our punishment was laid squarely on him. Verse 6 says, all of us have gone astray. Now let's get honest. You don't have to enjoy it, but say amen. All of us have gone astray. All of us have, have sinned in our life. And if you think you don't, there's your sin right there, pride. You're not paying attention. Ask your spouse, they'll tell you. <laughs> Nobody's perfect. All of us have gone astray, turning to our own way. Tell me it ain't so. And the Lord has laid upon him, not Jacob. The Lord hasn't laid your sin upon the people of Israel. The Lord has laid upon him the sin of us all. Going to verse number seven, he was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. You know that part of the story. He goes before King Herod. He had the opportunity to plead his, his case. Before Pilate, he was quiet. Pilate kept saying, speak on your behalf. The, tr the charges were trumped up. Everybody knew the facts didn't add up. Defend yourself, say something. The gospels tell us Jesus just stood there quiet when everybody in the room knew these were lies because there was a secret to him. He did not come to live. He came to die that you might live. His death was necessary. It was important. He couldn't rescue himself without punishing you. So he took the abuse. Oppressed and afflicted, he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. For he was cut off from the land of the living. I'm glad I know what that means. That means he never married. He didn't have any sons. He didn't have anybody following after him. He died a single man with no children and no family. He was cut off from the land of the living. He has no heirs. That's what that means. That's how the Jews would understand it. So how can this be the Jews when there's all kinds of children in the Jews? Jacob had Jews. They still can't see Jesus in this. For he was stricken for the sins of others. The second part of verse 8. Assigned a grave with the wicked. You know that part of the story. He was nailed between two guilty thieves. He was assigned a grave, a death, there with the wicked and with the rich. In his death, Joseph of Arimathea, knowing he had, that Jesus had no place to be buried, let him borrow this rich man's tomb. He wasn't going to be there long anyway, but Joseph didn't know that. A rich man had pity on Jesus, burying him in the family tomb. Isaiah tells us over 700 years before, he will be with the rich in his death. And he was. Though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. After the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life. What does that mean? He is not going to be underground for long. He will see the light of life. The resurrection is coming. For he poured out his life unto death and bore the sin of many. Many today even in Louisa, even in southern New York, even in Pennsylvania and Maryland and West Virginia and what, uh, wherever I managed to pass through, even in my hometown, even in my home church, many today are still blind to what God has done for us. Though he has already told us the plan. This is my son in whom I am well pleased. That's the plan. 
there's a story that's told, it's fictional, of course, that Jesus and the Lord are speaking before the, the terrible coming of Jesus and the life story and the death and the resurrection and the abuse and everything. And God says, son, the plan is this. You will go to earth. You will know what it's like to be cold and hot and hungry. I'm going to give you godly parents, but they don't have much to offer you. You're not going to be esteemed. And I'm giving you a tough job. And you're to preach the truth as you know it is to be preached. But they're not going to receive you. And there will be nails. And there'll be a whip. And there will be a tomb. Son, it's going to hurt. And in so doing, the world has the opportunity to have forgiveness through your blood. And in this story, Jesus says, um, Okay, what's plan B? And God says, son, there is no plan B. It is us or them. Do you love them enough? And the son said, yes. And at his baptism, the father looked down and said, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. Well, let me just close by saying this. Your Bible still works. The altar still works. And it hasn't been too long since I've seen somebody drop to the altar with tears and get up with joy. And their potty mouth was gone and their wallet was opened and their, their smile was so big they almost had to buy a wider shirt. And they were different. They were just different. They were new. They were born again. And it used to happen when Jesus preached. And it used to happen when the disciples preached. And then it happened as the apostles and Paul and Peter. It happened with John Wesley. It happened with Charles Spur Spurgeon. It happened on and on. It happened with Billy Graham. And now they're all gone. But it still happens today. Because the secret to a victorious life is not Billy or John or Paul or Peter. It is the Holy Spirit of God himself. The power to live a godly life is found in him. And he is here. So as we sing our final song, which is slow and meditative, do what you need to do. If you need to get down on your knees there at your pew and just have a conversation with God, do it. If you need to be at the altar for some reason, do it. If you haven't asked Jesus into your life, but you know who he is, you just haven't submitted to him, do that. If your love for Christ has grown cold, if your love for your spouse has grown cold, if your kids are driving you crazy and you need something to help you, draw near to God and ask for what you need. It's Easter once again in the middle of October and the creator of the universe loves you to pieces. Draw near as we sing our final hymn, which is...